This is the last uh, of the series on Psalm 1, uh, as we have been talking about the subject of happiness for the last few weeks. If you could also refer to the handout along with your church bulletin for the outline of the sermon, it gives you a basic point of what I am about to share with you uh, this morning. You know, what the psalmist uh, is doing here, as I have been showing, is to teach us and to instruct us. Uh, to the one and only way in which true happiness uh, or blessedness can be found. A true way, one and only way that happiness can truly be gained and experienced. If it's one thing that we all desire, regardless of our backgrounds, regardless of our nationalities or even religions, is is happiness, isn't it? We desire happiness, and the psalmist has a very definite view of life and what kind of life leads to happiness that is real, that is true, that is eternal. And according to the psalmist, there are two types of men, two ways of life, godly and ungodly. And his point is to show that the only hope of a real happiness, that the only chance of a true happiness is to be godly. Is to be godly. True happiness depends, he says, ultimately upon our relationship to God and upon what we are as a result of that relationship with Him. The Bible is the most honest book. It's the most real book that you will ever come across. It does not say that life is like a fairy tale. It does not say that somehow uh, that we are all destined to be happy. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that everything will be perfect and beautiful. In fact, the Bible says that this world is really, since the fall of the first human beings, wicked and sinful, which is why there are still ongoing Conflicts, endless wars and suffering because of the sin that's been passed down through generations from the very beginning. And the the masterminds, the geniuses of our world have tried to investigate this subject of happiness and have, quite frankly, ended in despair, many of them, and concluded, rather, that life is tragic, pointless, But the psalmist has been saying in Psalm 1, from the very beginning of his book, as he opens the message, that true happiness, regardless of what other people may say in this world, regardless of how sinful this world really is, that true happiness is indeed possible. That's his view. And that it is is obtainable even in a such world as this. And this happiness is not contingent upon circumstances, he says. It is a happiness that lasts, a happiness that is sustainable, that does not go away. It's the happiness that enables us to meet all eventualities and contingencies of life without losing hope, without losing hope. But now, as the psalmist concludes the first chapter, he goes further. What does he say about true happiness? Well, he tells us that it is a happiness that goes on forever. I haven't come across any teaching on happiness that claims this. It's the only, the Bible is the only book in our existence to claim such thing. The happiness that the psalmist has in view, that the happiness that comes from God is the happiness that goes on forever forever it does not stop with this world it does not stop with this for, uh, with this world it goes on even to the next world and the psalmist tells us that the kind of happiness which the ungodly world offers the pleasures that this world offers is either something that eventually phases out in other words it disappears regardless of how fancy or how beautiful, how perfect they may look. See, the the, the kind of pleasures or the happiness that this world offers is destined to pass away. Destined to pass away. Or eventually lead to destruction. So this consideration of the end 
is what makes the biblical message so unique and so powerful. It is this thing. It is this thing that makes the, the, the kind of happiness which the Bible talks about different and distinguished from the kind of happiness that the world offers. It is the thing that distinguishes it from every other kind of teaching that offers itself to the human race. Now, the ultimate trouble with the man who is ungodly, according to the psalmist, is that he is a fool. The ultimate trouble with a man who is ungodly and who pursues ungodly happiness, according to the psalmist, it's not my word, but the psalmist's word, is that he is a fool. So what makes him say such a thing? Well, ungodly man is a fool because he tends to live only for the present. That's really the, 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 the worldview, the lifestyle of ungodly man. He only lives for the present. He never looks ahead. He never looks ahead. He is concerned only about the happiness for the moment, right now, for this present moment. Ungodly man does not cons uh, consider the consequences or the results or the outcomes. All he wants is what he can get, what he can get now. Now have a look at uh, Colossians chapter 3 verse 5 and see what ungodly man pursues in life. See, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, sexual pleasure, impurity, you know, lust, evil desires, and greed, which the Bible says is idolatry. Perhaps the most severe sin is idolatry, according to the Bible, isn't it? And such an attitude of life cannot wait, you know? Such an uh, attitude of ungodly life in this world, it must have what it wants now, you know? And it will do whatever it takes to get what it wants. And the Bible tells us everywhere that the ungodly men, and, and when I say ungodly, is really referring to men and women in sin, right? Without God. Yeah? So ungodly men have this small view of life. What you see is what you get. You know, this present only, this self-centered way of life. And there's no happiness there. It may give you that temporary pleasure, and you may think that it's a happiness, but it isn't. It isn't. And the psalmist makes that, makes that absolutely clear, abundantly clear. See, ungodly men prefer to be ignorant about what really matters in life, about the essence of life, about the essence of faith that saves a man. You know, ungodly men would prefer to be ignorant about uh, matters of eternity, for instance. What happens when we die? You know, what lies beyond this present life? Ungodly ma men would rather prefer to be ignorant about these matters and they simply refuse to look at and to face the end of life. No answer for that. They're not interested. They prefer rather to be ignorant about these things that really matter in life. Why anticipate future, they say. Why, why look forward uh, to the future, they say. Live for the moment. Enjoy yourself for the moment. Let us eat, let us drink, and let us be merry. That really is the typical attitude, isn't it, of the world that we live in without God. It dislikes any suggestion or teaching that it should look ahead and consider what is going to happen and what it is all leading to. doesn't like any suggestions or teachings of that sort at all. That is the secular attitude, isn't it? That is the, uh, the, the, the very typical common attitude of the world that is ungodly. It does not believe in the unseen or in the spiritual realm of life. The psalmist says that people who hold this kind of view are fools. Don't you just love the way that the Bible is brutally honest? 
You know? The world does not like to face and to consider the future. It doesn't. But the Bible everywhere reasons with us and is always appealing to us to do so. Just as this man here in the first psalm is telling us to do. The Bible, in other words, always emphasizes the wholeness of life. If you want, if you desire true happiness that lasts, if you desire happiness eternal, which is really what the Bible is teaching us, right? See, if you, if, if you want that sort of life that is full, that is blessed, the Bible says, right? The Bible says we must see, we must consider the wholeness of life, the unity of life, if you like, the holistic view of life that considers not just the present and the past, but also the future, but also the future. The ungodly world is not interested in thinking ahead. The ungodly men and women are simply not interested in thinking ahead. Have a good time now. Have this enjoyment now. No, says the Bible. Look ahead. Don't be blinded by the um, temporary pleasures that will not last. Look ahead. Don't indulge yourself until you have considered what it may lead to. Don't do anything until you have considered the possible effects and results or consequences. That, that, that's really the kind of uh, the world view that the Bible promotes. Think of the end. Think of what your present action may lead towards. But the world doesn't do that. The world says, don't think about that. You know, get what you want right now. Enjoy now. Let us drink now. Let us eat now. And let us be merry now. What happens? Who knows? No answers there. Can't help you. Can't help you. But life, says the Bible, is a whole. It's a unity whether you like it or not, is past, present, and future. So you see, the kind of happiness that is eternal comes only when we consider the wholeness of life. And the second point is this, this morning. The Bible proclaims that death is not the end. Amen? Death is not the end. This world that we live in is only a temporary world. We are only pilgrims, to borrow the words of John Bunyan, uh, the author of, um, uh, of many books that have been spiritually so uh, inspiring. He said that we are only pilgrims, only strangers here in this world, travelers. And the Bible always tells us that after death, there's a judgment. Judgment. And that's really what the psalmist, uh, to begin his message with, emphasizes. The fate of the ungodly world. The fate of the ungodly men and women is that they shall not stand in the judgment. They will have no chance in the judgment. And this is vital. This is vital because our eternal destiny in the spiritual realm to which we go when we leave this world is determined by our life and attitude in this world. So what happens to us there in eternity is the inevitable and logical outcome of what we are here, what we think, what we believe, and how we live. And this is really is the, the great central message of the entire gospel, isn't it? with respect to life. The psalmist here is effectively saying that the only man or woman who is truly blessed, who is truly happy, is the one who is ready for all. Who is ready for all phases and stages of life. Including the end, death, and what lies beyond it. So truly happy man or woman is the person who knows, right, what she or he is destined to be, even after death, which is really what the Bible is, is really about, isn't it? Right? What we are here affects 
and echoes you know in eternity that really is the secret says the psalmist of happiness and of a true blessedness if you want to be truly blessed if you want to be truly happy he says that you must consider the end as well as the beginning and the present you must get the whole view of life a holistic view of life is essential right and the author of um, the Hebrews chapter 2 verse 15 tells us right that as you see many people in this world who by fear of death are held in slavery all their lifetime right? because they have no answers the ungodly men or women have no answers to the end of life for the end of life and what happens after death because of that fear because of that uncertainty of, of life after death, people are held in captive. People are held in slavery in this world. And as, as a result of that fear, it, it severely affects, you know, our daily performance, our daily life. In other words, you cannot get true happiness in this world unless you have a faith that sees through death. You must have a view of life that cares for the beginning and the end all-inclusive all-inclusive so let us consider this matter of the end and the psalmist makes this uh, I believe into uh, three uh, propositions the first thing that he says that we must be clear about and isn't it interesting that the message of judgment rather than primarily intending to condemn the message of judgment is part of the message of his blessing right knowing this judgment knowing that, that that God's wrath falls upon ungodly men and women is really the center the essence of good message you know good news that saves right so his, his, his uh, purpose of uh, emphasizing upon the judgment rather than primarily to condemn it, it is to encourage is to give us hope in the salvation of God now the secular mind uh, will immediately ob object to this and say well judgment hang on a minute if you believe in God of love then judgment is something that is entirely and utterly incompatible with such a God who is love how can you say that God is love and and talk about judgment it, it, it's unsettling it doesn't sit well with me what do you mean by that but you see all this ob uh, objection to judgment all this uh, rejection of God's nature as a judge is really ultimately based upon a completely false view of God and the love of God you know we have our own definition of love that is this, that, that is not really um, uh, biblical and through that lens we interpret God and what God should be uh, such an interpretation and approach to God's character is essentially flawed we must know that we must be aware of that so to really know the character and the attributes of God we must come to the Bible and what it says right and the record of God's revelation of himself to all men and women the authors of the Bible say okay people this is what I think about God this is my conjecture of what God might be this is my speculation of God's character you may disagree with me or agree with me it's never presented that way never presented that way it's a factual account as I say it's the most honest book it tells the story as it is you know it doesn't exaggerate it doesn't lie about it they say the prophets and all these men and women of God they say God spoke to me God spoke to me God gave me a direct revelation God called a man like Moses literally to the top of Mount Sinai and began to speak over and against all this rejection of the notion of judgment right? if there is anything that is perfectly plain in the Bible is judgment judgment you know when God uh, made Adam and Eve and put them in the garden 
He said, if you break my law, I will give you all these things in abundance. All this is yours to take hold of and take care of and lord over. Right? But if you break my laws, I will exclude you from the garden. He said that. He warned them of that. They knew that. And when they broke the law, see, God's judgment fell upon them. He did. He did exactly what he said he would do. And the Old Testament is full of it. It's judgment. Right? You get it in the case of individuals. You get it in the case of the whole nation of Israel. Even God's own, own people were not exempt from, from the wrath of God, from judgment of God. And as a result of their sin, as a result of breaking the law, God sent Israel uh, into captivity uh, to, to Babylon because of their sin. Judgment. What else? He warned that he would do it, and he did. He did. Then when you come to the New Testament, you find the first uh, preacher that appears before us. Who is that? It's John the Baptist, isn't it? Uh, the forerunner of the Messiah. And he preached the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That's the first message. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near, and believe the gospel. That really was the essence of his message. Have a look at Luke chapter 3, verse 7. He addressed the congregation of the Pharisees and scribes and others, and he said, Who warned you to flee? From what? Flee from what? From the coming wrath. From the judgment of God. Let me ask you a question. Why is gospel a good news? Why is a gospel a gospel of salvation? Well, there's only one reason, isn't it? Only one reason. It saves us from judgment. Amen? It saves us from judgment and the wrath to come. That's why it's a good news. That's why it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a gospel of salvation. Because it saves us from the inevitable and the impending judgment of God. Unless we repent. Unless we turn to God. Unless we believe the gospel. Our Lord Jesus himself also preached it. The day is coming, he said. The day is coming. When all who are in the graves are going to rise. And they will all be judged. Let's have a look at John chapter 5 verses 28 to 29. Let's read that together. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. See, and let's have a look at Hebrew chapter 9, verses 27 to 28. Let's read that together. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. But to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Do not, fo do not follow the ungodly. Do not waste your time following the ungodly values of the world or ungodly men and women why because you must face that judgment and the ungodly cannot help you will never be able to offer you anything right in fact they will have no feet to stand on right? in that context of judgment and salvation you see psalmist defines what happiness truly means as i say right happiness it's never really made as the ultimate uh, object of Christian life. In fact, happiness is a byproduct of pursuing something infinitely greater. Right? Infinitely greater. And he says, if you want true happiness, know that this life is only temporary. temporary and there's another spiritual life that lies beyond, that exists beyond our physical life now. And you must be clear about what will happen to you once we phase away from this world and the bible makes that so very clear you know about what's going to happen only in that knowledge only in that uh, faith can true happiness be gained knowing what lies beyond our physical death in this world so the first uh, thing about judgment Life after death is the certainty 
uh, or the fact of judgment. And the Bible makes it very clear uh, throughout its entirety. The second principle that I want to draw your attention to is the nature of judgment. What is the nature of this judgment? Again, you know, through our concept of what God should be, right? When we think of God as love, yeah, we, we, can, we have all kinds of misconceptions and bias uh, in interpreting uh, the Word of God. And sometimes that affects our knowledge and relationship uh, with God. But let me draw your attention to how the Bible uh, defines and teaches, teaches us about the nature of this judgment. Now, it is a judgment that takes place partly in this world. God uh, punishes justly people in this world for their wrongdoings and, and sin, uh, as sin produces certain amount of punishment even here and now. But the great message of the Bible is, is of course, to tell us that it is at the end that the judgment really comes. The first psalm and the entire word of God teaches that everybody, everybody, including believers and non-believers, to appear before God in the judgment. And God is the judge because God alone is perfectly just and righteous. But the authority of the judgment, the Bible says, has been given to our Lord Jesus Christ, as we see in the book of Romans, to make the trial, to make the judgment even more fair. Right? Because the Son of God has become the Son of Man as one of us. So he knows, you know, he himself has gone through what we go through on a daily basis, right? He understands, he empathizes with our needs and with the kind of temptations that we struggle with. So to make the judgment even more fair and just, God, Father God has given the authority of judgment to his son. So Lord Jesus Christ at the end will be our judge. And it's a fair one. I'd rather be judged by our Lord Jesus Christ than anybody else. Right? Because I, I know, I have faith that he alone is just and perfect. He himself has become man despite all the authority of heaven. The Son has lived in this world and was in all points tempted like us. Hebrew chapter 4, verse 15 makes this very clear. And he says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted. Jesus Christ himself, our Lord himself, has been tempted in every way, just as we are, and yet he did not sin. He did not sin. So what is the standard of judgment what is the standard of judgment well we shall be judged according to that which the psalmist has talked so much about and what, what did he talk so much about happy is the man who meditates upon the law of God day and night right and we will be judged precisely according to that standard the law of God the Word of God itself so you may say, okay, what is the law of God? Well, what am I referring to when I say the law of God? Well, the clearest in the Old Testament, the law of Moses, the law of God, uh, can be summarized as the Ten Commandments, uh, which are God's statements of what He demands and what He expects from each one of us who are His covenant people, right? who have entered in this um, living relationship living agreement with God and he expects us to 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 reflect his image in our in our life right and that's um, what Ten Commandments is supposed to achieve and the prophets throughout the Old Testament have expounded upon the Ten Commandments and they have given their own uh, teaching uh, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit as to what God expects from his people and of course, in the New Testament, our Lord Jesus himself, uh, on the sermon, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, expounded it even more perfectly. And our Lord Jesus summed it up like this, as to what the law of God is really essentially about, in Mark chapter 12, verses 30 to 31. Let's read that together. 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. So we may safely assume that the Lord Jesus himself has summarized the essence of the law of God as follows. First, to love the God with everything that you are. Right? And second, that love should translate into our relationship with each other. Love the neighbor as yourself. So, and, and the psalmist is consistent, right? We will be judged by that law, okay? By this law that the Lord has uh, summarized, right? In term, into the bare essentials of the law of God. We will be judged by that law, by this law. It is not the actual deeds alone uh, that matter, but our thoughts, our hearts. God knows them all. And that is what is precisely emphasized by the psalmist here in Psalm 1. Okay? The Lord knows the way of the righteous. Our God knows the way of good people, godly people. But the way of the ungodly, the Bible proclaims, shall perish. Shall perish. The Lord knows. He is omniscient. That's really what comes forth. That's what really is emphasized in Psalm 1. He knows. God knows what you're going through. God knows the kind of sacrifices that you are having to make as a result of following Him. As a result of being a Christian. As a result of being a godly man and woman that you are. He knows. And he will write, reward you in his perfect time, in his perfect way. But the way of the ungodly godly will not be like that. It will perish. Hebrew chapter 4, verse 13. God knows. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is laid bare Everything is uncovered before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Again, Hebrews really says the same thing as the psalmist here. We must answer to God Almighty at the end, at the judgment. Right, we will be rewarded or punished accordingly uh, in this life and more. And that brings me uh, to my third and my last principle is this. It's the consequence of judgment. It's the consequence of judgment. What is the consequence of the wicked people? What is the consequence of the ungodly people? I've said that in part already. The wicked will not stand in the judgment. The wicked people will not stand in this judgment of God. No sinners in the assembly of the righteous, they will have no chance. The ungodly, the wicked, as we shall see throughout the psalm, he describes it in such graphic detail of what ungodly man does. And it's very typical, and it even uh, speaks to us at this present age as to what ungodly secular world is really like. Right? The wicked, the ungodly, have never given God a thought. They lived as though that there were no God. Such is the wicked. Such is the ungodly. They have insisted and gone their own way. And if God were ever mentioned to them, they hated it. They ridiculed it. They scoffed at it. And they had not kept the law. Oh no. And instead of delighting and meditating upon the law, day and night, they hated it. Again, they ridiculed it. They made fun of it. They mocked it. They mocked, in fact, all the decencies and the sanctities of life. They did not believe in that special creation, in that special destiny, that man was made in God's image, and that man was destined to enjoy the, 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 the companionship with God. And instead, the ungodly said, that man is just an animal that evolved. And, and, having, and they're saying that, the ungodly was really insulting themselves. You know, and insulting God Almighty. 
who created them. These ungodly people have lived a life that is like the chaff, as we have covered last week. Chaff that blows away. That chaff that has a form, an outer covering, the appearance, but entirely lacking the, 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 the essence of life, the real content, the kernel of life. It's like a chaff which the wind drives away. But I can almost hear someone ask, or some I still ask, okay, so we'll be judged according to this law and we live with that knowledge in this world and that's where our true happiness and joy comes from, knowing that we are saved from this uh, judgment of God. But if we, if, we are, if we are judged by the law of God, which Jesus in Mark's gospel has kindly summarized for us, isn't the standard too high, you might ask? I mean, who could live like that? You know, could you live and keep the law in perfection? I, I try. We all try. But we all fail. And, and this is a fact, right? This is the truth, isn't it? Who could live like that? Who could love God? Who could love God? With all his heart, with all his mind, with all his soul, with all his strength, and love the neighbors as yourself. I mean, who could keep the Sermon on the Mount? I mean, I'm not in any way degrading the nature of the teaching, but I'm just asking, who could keep that in perfection? Who could, keep, who could live the Ten Commandments in perfection? It's impossible, and you're right. It is impossible. So some might say, well, the judgment of God then is, is unfair. None of us have any chance. Ah, but the Lord Jesus has given us also a very clear and plain answer to that very question too. And he said this. He said, I came not to call upon the righteous. He came not to call upon the righteous. He said that I came to call upon the sinners to repentance so that they may be saved so that they may live from this judgment of God and enjoy the eternal happiness. Luke chapter 5, verses 31 to 32. Let's read that together. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have come to call the righteous. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Amen. The final condemnation, therefore, is not whether we are able to keep the law in perfection or not. It's not whether we have lived, uh, you know, in, in, adherence, in adherence to the law. Even though, of course, you know, living by the law is, is, is you know, it's important, it's promoted. But the final condemnation, the final condemnation is that God's offer of such free salvation in Jesus Christ was refused and despised. So really, when Jesus himself has come to call upon the sinners and provided sinners, the wicked, the chaff-like people, a way out through him and through his word for people who insist and refuse to listen to that and refuse to accept Jesus as their Savior, really have no excuse. No excuse. Right? Because of such uh, stubbornness, the psalmist says, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment. That is the end of the ungodly. That is the final destiny and fate of the ungodly. Total darkness at the end. Do not be fooled by what the world promises or offers the ungodly world eventually leads to nothingness to total deprivation to destruction things that will all pass away in time but the happiness eternal that comes from the lord see lasts forever lasts forever matthew chapter 8 verse 12 our lord jesus himself said right uh, the ungodly, um, 
the subjects of the kingdom, the ungodly, will be thrown outside into darkness where they will be weeping and the gnashing of teeth. That is the final destiny according to the words of Jesus. Right? The final destiny of the ungodly men and women. That they will be thrown out of the kingdom of God. For those who have insisted upon their sinful ways and stubbornness into, um, and, and refuse and reject the message of the gospel, they will be thrown into darkness where they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So why is this all written? I'd like to finish uh, with this one last um, message. Um, message. It's because that God is love. Amen? It's because God is love. It is written to, to warn us where there is yet time. Where there is yet time. It is written, the gospel, the Bible, the entire Bible is written to save us. It's not written to condemn us. It's not written to curse us. It is not written to frighten us. No, that, that just isn't the intention, is it? It is written to save us. Amen? That is really the whole message of the gospel. Salvation from judgment. Salvation from judgment. That is why Christ, the Son of God, came into this world to die for us. To die for us that are ungodly. Right? And sinful. And weak. Like the chaff. According to the description of the psalmist. The Bible says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you shall be saved. That is the essence of the message, isn't it? The essence of the message. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. The door is not shut. In Christ, you see, in Christ, we don't need to fear the judgment. And that's really what living a Christian life is all about, isn't it? Right? Knowing that in Christ, not even the power of death can thwart us. Right? From the destiny of God that is already living within us. Amen? What an assurance of salvation. What a joy that comes from such assurance that brings us true happiness that is eternal. If you are in Christ, folks, if you are in Christ, nothing and no one can bring any charge against you. Not the death itself. Not even the death itself. That is the essence of the gospel, isn't it? I'd like to conclude today's sermon with one final verse from Romans chapter 8, verses 33 to 34. And this is the life of a Christian. The life that is unswayable. The life that is solid in this world and beyond as well. Let's read that together. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for you, for us. Let us pray. At this time, I'd like to invite the EPT, please. Let us ask uh, that um, as we meditate upon this message, let us ask that God will enlarge our mind and enlarge our, our scope, our vision, enlarge our hearts so that we will have the wholeness of life, that we will consider not just the present struggles and the circumstances, but also the future and what we are destined to be. And be reminded also of the fact that we are only pilgrims in this world, only strangers and travelers of this world, and that our true destiny, our true um, address, eternal, is with God. So let's ask God to enlarge our scope, enlarge our mind. Let's make that our prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, help us to broaden our mind.
us also give thanks and praise to God for saving us from the judgment through his son Christ Jesus the ungodly life that we once led was destined to pass away but out of the mercy of God and the love of God that knows no limit that we have been saved once and for all through his son Christ Jesus that we are destined to eternal happiness the happiness that the world cannot steal from us the happiness that the world cannot indeed even fathom so let us give thanks to God despite our ungodliness despite our weakness despite being a chaff when we were meant to be trees he has not left us he has not left you to fend for yourself but has graciously given us a way out the source of eternal happiness has already been given to us in his word so let us give thanks let us give our honor and praise for that final hymn. 